A definition of stigma, I just sometimes like to look at definitions, apparently is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality or person. And apparently um, the idea of st stigma originated in about the 16th century. I mean, obviously the concept would have been there forever probably, but it uh, kind of got written down as it were. And it donated a mark made by pricking or branding. And I just thought that was interesting because branding in particular is about something permanent and it's for life. Um, and as if once a person admits to struggling with an aspect of life, whether internally or externally, they may forever be defined or branded as someone that's weak, unable to cope, and not like the rest of us normal folk. So let me lay out my stool. My bit on stigma will be largely drawn from my own personal experiences and thoughts, and I'm very nervous about sharing this, quite frankly. Uh, I'm nervous about being this vulnerable. I'm nervous about being vulnerable anywhere, particularly in a place where quite a few people know my face. Um, but I do basically think it, this kind of stuff is part of my own personal recovery, so it's worth it. Um, and also, it, quite frankly, I hope it diminishes some of the power of stigma, which also helps me. Um, OK, on with it. I grew up with a dad that, it would seem, suffered from very acute bipolar. He was also an addict, principally to alcohol, but also possibly marijuana. And I know a lot of people are quite relaxed about marijuana, but he used to smoke the strong stuff and quite excessively. And when you're quite prone to being high, it's quite a powerful concoction. Um, he was essentially a very, very kind and loving man. But when he was ill, he could be absolutely destructive and terrifying, primarily to himself, but pretty much to everyone around him too. So much so that despite my love for him, for about two and a half years, when I was about 13 or 14, I refused to have any contact with him whatsoever. My childhood and teenage years were difficult. For much of it, my dad was very unwell, in active addiction and actively suicidal and made several very serious attempts on his life. He was in and out of hospital for many, many years. Um, I'm really shaking, I can feel it. Um, he was high and had messianic beliefs, or he was absolutely depressed and dead to the world. Um, his denial about his mental illness and addiction just, well, made matters far, far worse. Sectioning, forced electroconvulsive treatment, and at times taking enough medication to sedate a horse, yet still remaining high and manic. These were his lot. I recall as a child visiting him at Guy's Hospital, a previously brilliant man, now stooped in front of the TV, inane daytime TV programs blaring, compulsively smoking, dribbling down himself to the sedative effect, due to the sedative effects of his medication. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't all awful and depressing. We managed to have many happy moments. But I think deep down I always knew that Dad really wanted to be dead, so he could simply stop suffering. I felt that this was a secret we shared. He eventually did kill himself on March the 4th, 2000, by jumping in front of a train. So severe mental illness, instability, paranoia, confusion, addiction, suicide, dad's inevitable decline into a state where he was not able to work, and the breakdown of a family were the back, backdrop for me developmentally. I did have the support of a very loving mother, who was also very skilled at working with trauma. Ironically, this was her job. Um, and a lovely sister, and a lovely wider family and friends too. But... This only mitigated some of the effects. And of course, all, all of these aspects of life carry a fairly large dose of sto stigma for an adult, let alone a child and young adult. For my father's parents, in many ways, they and their peers regarded his mental illness and addiction a sign that he was simply weak-willed and unable to cope, and there, therefore he represented a source of great shame for the family, a failure of upbringing, his addiction, in particular, which I now view as a form of mental illness, was particularly shameful. What do I remember? Deep grief. Profound shame. And I still feel some of that, despite not wishing to. Profound isolation, rage, embarrassment, and overall and overridingly fear. And to a very large extent, that still remains with me to today. I think at some deep level, a child or young adult does comply with society's need not to fully embrace and accept the mentally unwell. As a young boy, it is very important who your dad is. What could I say to people about mine? What was expected? What should not be mentioned? Just what were the implicit rules of silence and denial that I, see, that I sensed I should obey? 
I found it very difficult to relate to my peers, who in comparison to me seemed to be so carefree and joyous. My own interest in life diminished. Who cares about A-levels and girls when dad wants to die? So I've grown up with this and to this day still feel profoundly alone. Even though I'm blessed with beautiful friends, meaningful work and very supportive and loving family, I just have an acute sense that no one really knows what it is like to live with the terror, confusion, grief and rage that for so many years I buried and, to, and society and stigma encouraged me to keep buried. It seemed to me that society was not only a place where, where stigma and judgment thrived, but was also deeply in denial itself. If I did try and talk to people about how I thought my dad would kill himself, and I did, I would largely be encouraged to look on the bright side and that it might not happen. How could I be sure? Maybe dad's actions were ways of seeking additional support, attention, going through a bad patch, but things would get better. Of course, these responses were well-intentioned, but in truth, not very helpful. As if my truth were not acceptable or valid. In many ways, it seemed to me that there was, and maybe still is, an unspoken conspiracy to not talk about mental illness, addiction and suicide, as if just by raising it, such ideas could become contagious, as if the shame associated with these issues is just too much to bear. No, no, no. Far better and safer to talk about the weather and what's happening on the latest TV soap drama. A couple of years after his suicide, I myself became very unwell and was sectioned, and there was quite a story behind that, and eventually diagnosed with bipolar 2. It wasn't until years later that I finally acknowledged to my innermost self that I too had a problem with alcohol and I no longer drink. And so I have had to live with the stigma of having a label, an alcoholic bipolar, unstable, chaotic, damaged goods, truly my father's son. Without doubt, the stigma in society about mental and emotional distress is very damaging. But it seems to me the real damage of stigma is that it tends to get internalised and then it is very easy to imprison oneself with a label, for example, I am bipolar, this defines me, without, fit, without any further encouragement for society being necessary. One becomes self-censoring and one's own oppressor. If society were a person, I think it would be deemed very unwell. Obsession with celebrity and the body beautiful, status, money and power, little thoughts for the planet or others, and a neurotic belief that being busy and stressed are signs of a life fully lived. <laughs> where, we can, where we unconditionally worship the provable, glorious science, as mindlessly as it would seem previous generations unconditionally worshipped the unapprovable. The implied maximum being, if it can't be measured, then it doesn't exist. Where does this leave love, I ask? But that's a topic for another day. From my experience, many people that get labelled with a mental health diagnosis have had some form of significant trauma in their life. Abuse, addiction, directly or indirectly, abandonment, emotionally repressed or dysfunctional family system, systems, the list goes on. Could it be that people that are labelled mentally unwell simply are more sensitive to the madness all around them? I really don't know, but I do sometimes wonder. So over the years, I have learned ways to deal with stigma. Humour is probably the thing that I rely on most. I've learned not to take anything too seriously. Life simply is too short. Therapy has been very, very helpful for me. Deep, deep exploration of my own traumas and issues is undoubtedly helpful. Um, I also um, ended up in 12-step AA for me, and that, that has proved very, very helpful. Um, overall, I've just learned to need the approval of others less. The strange thing is that, is that it seems to me that in many instances we give our powers to others without realising it. Being able to be vulnerable, particularly with people I don't know that well, so some of you here, um, is a sign of great internal strength, I now believe, and this in itself gives me a lot of freedom. Philosophy. I particularly love the work of Epicurus. If you haven't... Uh, ever read this chap, I strongly recommend it. Uh, he's a huge thinker, but he's, he's got a beautiful idea about ripples, the idea of you know, the, pebble in the, the pebble in the water and, and the positive stuff going out from it. Being open, honest and okay with my truth, but not needing it to be the version of truth that others have to share. There is plenty of room for everybody. And of course, working and being at the DC amongst fellow travelers. Finally, my hope is that one day emotional and mental health will be as readily discussed and accepted as we would having the flu. That people see the similarities, not the difference. And finally, I have to give the words, and I've done this on many occasions before, to Mahatma Gandhi, who says, 
you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you.